nearly 221 million subscribers across 190 countries, over a billion hours watched for a single TV show, a near 10% hold of global internet traffic, 226 awards, and at one point a market cap of $314 billion. For 25 years, one company changed the landscape of film and TV forever, with revenue and subscriber base growing a whopping average of more than 30% a year. But things are looking different for Netflix in 2022. In Q1, its revenue growth fell to just over 2%, compared to more than 7% in the same quarter the year prior. Its stock dropped 35%, and $50 billion was wiped off its market cap. The company lost nearly 1 million subscribers, and competitors are catching up. Investors and Netflix watchers are wondering, the days of the astronomical growth are simply over. Blockbuster Total Access, Netflix. Essentially, they work the same way. You order movies online, they come right to your mailbox, you watch them, then mail them back in a prepaid envelope. This is an ad from Blockbuster's marketing campaign that launched in February of 2007. Its goal? To take a shot at then-rival Netflix, who had a similar business model of renting DVDs online. For many years, Blockbuster simply ignored Netflix. And one of the charts that I maintained kind of showed different quotes over time that Blockbuster leadership had. And one of the things they consistently said was, this online thing, no more than 5%, no more than 5%. So they, they purposefully ignored us for years. This is Dr. Joel Meyer. He's currently a professor at the University of Richmond. And from 1999 to 2007, he was the marketing director at Netflix. An early, early version of Netflix had DVD rentals and DVD sales. Walmart, Best Buy, et cetera, they're going to begin to procure inventory and they're going to have economies of scale that we're simply never going to have. And so in that moment, they realized sales is not the future. They made the decision to kill all sales, right? To kill all sales and to bet big and solely on rental. So they overnight said, nope, sales are done. They killed 95% of revenue. They took all those resources. They aimed it at rental. The company went public in 2002 at a share price of $15. For the next five years, the company and its business model of subscription-based renting was an immediate hit as revenue and subscribers soared. Netflix was facing steep competition from then-rival Blockbuster in the renting wars. But for Netflix, the DVD by mail business was never in its future. In July of 99, okay? I, I go into the office, it's totally chaotic, it's disheveled, it's just unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. And I meet this guy who's the CEO, Mark Randolph, and we're in his office and we're chatting and he's really relaxed and really mellow and just, and he tells me something that I just struck me as like, what the hell are you talking about? He said to me, yeah, DVD's already dead. In 2007, the company introduced streaming. $40 million was invested in data centers. Netflix's Watch Now feature became an instant hit, and slowly but surely, the company pivoted from DVD by mail to a streaming first company. Streaming revolutionized how film fanatics and TV junkies consumed content. Studios and production companies weren't accustomed to licensing for streaming, allowing Netflix to strike cheap deals. So this is how Netflix built its business. It basically went to all of the different uh, uh, producers of media and said, we will pay you tens of millions of dollars for your stuff that is not currently live on TV. And these companies said, great, nobody else is paying for this. So this is just free money for us. As Netflix became more and more aggressive about the rights that they want, specifically for television shows, they want something called stacking rights. They want the ability to show the entire library all at once. Okay. And until this point in the early aughts, um, the only companies who had the rights to distribute that type of stuff were the studios themselves when they sold them on box sets of DVDs or um, the cable companies. In 2007, the same year Netflix turned to streaming, Amazon and then startup Hulu jumped on the streaming bandwagon. The next 10 years proved to be crucial for Netflix. As the company expanded its reach and content offerings, Netflix indulged in a growth story few companies had witnessed prior. In 2012, its first ever TV show, Lilyhammer, launched. It was a critical first step for Netflix, introducing the binge model by releasing all episodes at once. The following year, Netflix introduced more originals with its first hit, House of Cards. 
In 2013, Netflix's focus on streaming started to pay off. Stock prices surged, revenues jumped, and subscriber growth skyrocketed. By 2017, through its expansion abroad and its content lineup, Netflix eclipsed 100 million subscribers, revenues near $12 billion, and its stock prices reached close to $200. Netflix outspent competitors on content as it developed one of the largest libraries online. Netflix became an aggregate of content from other studios and major media companies, and licensed content accounted for 93.2% of Netflix's catalog. It's in the years 2018, 2019, 2020, if you take a look at the Netflix stock price, it is just up and to the right. It is up and up and up. Wall Street was basically cheering on Netflix to spend more, more, more. That was a huge irritant to the legacy media companies who did not have the same mandate from Wall Street. Wall Street was telling those companies, we want you to be more uh, financially responsible with your spend. Whereas what it was telling Netflix was basically, if you can get all the customers now, we don't care how much money you need to spend. What we see here is a destruction of the legacy media model as long as you guys can just keep adding subscribers because the more subscribers you add, the more people will say, you know what, I can live on Netflix. So it was sort of the ultimate disruption. That's what Wall Street was saying to Netflix. Between 2012 and 2020, those legacy media companies had lost 25 million customers as fewer and fewer Americans were turning to cable or satellite. So naturally, they wanted in on streaming. At that point, the older media companies, meaning Disney, NBC Universal, Paramount Global, Warner Media, they all decided, you know what, the, the jig is up here we can't just give away all of our stuff to Netflix. Instead, we're gonna pull back all of that stuff, create our own streaming service, and we're gonna end this idea of licensing our best stuff, even if it's old, to another company. Disney is expected to unveil details of its new streaming service. Tim Cook just announcing that Apple TV Plus will start to roll out its first shows on November 1st. NBC Universal's streaming service in the works is called Peacock. HBO Max. Which the new streaming services needed content and they needed it fast. One way was to take back the content they'd licensed to Netflix. And Disney, NBC Universal, and Warner Media did exactly that. While the content mass exodus was tough on Netflix, it didn't come as a complete surprise. They always knew that they were going to have to make their own stuff because they knew that they were going to put a lot of people out of business. So they had to prepare for a time when they lost the most popular content on their platform. Rewind back to 2016, Netflix CFO David Wells announced the push for more Netflix originals. And in just six years, that number of original content went from 2.8% to roughly 50% of total content. There is some value of Netflix for having licensed content. In 2021, Netflix's most watched show was Criminal Minds, accumulating over 30 billion minutes watched across 12 seasons. Though licensed content made up most of the top shows for Netflix that year, shows like Squid Game proved to be a massive hit, with one season pulling in roughly half of the viewing time as Criminal Minds. However, that value of licensed content is quickly moving off the platform. Criminal Minds, the most streamed show in 2021, was pulled from Netflix and moved over to Paramount+. Plus. Netflix is still the most dominant streamer in terms of overall subscriber base, but Disney Plus is already catching up since launching in 2019. Netflix holds firm with 220.7 million subscribers. Disney Plus already has 152.1. Disney's other streamers, Hulu and ESPN Plus, account for 46.2 million and 22.8 million respectively. Disney's total subscriber base across all three platforms accounts for 221 million subscribers. In its Q1 of 2022, Netflix reported 200,000 subscribers were lost, and many analysts and investors feared that Q2 would look even worse. On July 19th, 2022, Netflix announced its Q2 earnings. The company beat expectations as Netflix lost nearly 1 million subscribers instead of the projected 2 million. Yet its rival Disney Plus continued to grow rapidly with 14.4 million new subscribers in its last quarter. For so long, Netflix appeared to be unreachable, but that's all changing as Netflix is losing subscribers and its competitors have more creative offerings. Netflix sits in an interesting place, almost exclusively in the media universe all of a sudden, which is they're the only one that only does premium video subscription and only video premium subscription. So they are competing with 
not only people who do exactly what they do, but they're also competing with uh, huge trillion dollar platforms. But Disney has sports, local news, ABC, Hulu, ESPN, and they're able to bundle those things together and offer a myriad of services to the end user that Netflix simply cannot. Does not have sports, does not have news, does not have local. In addition, Disney can bundle in uh, theme park tickets. Paramount Plus just teamed with Walmart Plus to create a really interesting bundle that I think is gonna do really, really well. And then you look at Amazon and Apple who are offering a raft of different services as a bundle to the consumers. Yes, you can order Amazon Prime Video or Apple TV Plus as a standalone product, but a lot of consumers take Amazon Prime as a bundle with free delivery of their Prilosec and their audio subscriptions and a number of other discounts at Whole Foods. During its challenging first half of 2022, Netflix cut about 450 jobs and announced it would reduce spending growth until 2024. Yet the company still plans on investing an estimated $17 billion on content. Netflix has always been known to spend lavishly on original content, and it was that kind of spending that was cheered on by investors on Wall Street, though the sentiment now has recently changed. If Wall Street is now no longer valuing Netflix on pure subscriber growth, it may start valuing on Netflix by other more traditional metrics such as net income or revenue or uh, EBITDA margins or whatever it may be. Over the past year, Netflix's stock has plummeted significantly. It peaked at over $690 per share in 2021 as the company was riding the pandemic stay-at-home orders to its lowest in 2022 at $175 per share, though the stock took off after beating projections in Q2. There would have to be a, a, a new narrative that overwhelmed the media industry in order for Netflix to get to $600 a share anytime soon. In order for Netflix to get back on top of the streaming wars it helped start, the company is planning on making some drastic changes to its business model and its content. Changes that would hopefully secure new subscribers, retain existing ones, and improve its stock, such as ads and cracking down on password sharing. Maybe the biggest, most impactful new thing that Netflix is planning on launching is an advertising supported tier. This will dramatically lower the price of Netflix. So it may introduce a whole new audience out there. The second one is uh, forcing all of these password sharers to actually pay for a Netflix subscription. Again, I don't know what percentage of the 100 million subscribers that Netflix says uh, are sharing passwords will actually sign up. The way Netflix plans on doing this is to actually go after the account holder that's sharing the password and asking the holder, hey, are you willing to pay an extra couple dollars per month? However, including advertisements to content, well, that may be easier said than done. Netflix is going to have to pay for the right to sell ads in the content that's already running on their platform. And they now have to ask for permission to insert ads into that content. And the studios are answering the phone and saying, hi, who are you? You destroyed our ecosystem. Yeah, you want to put ads in that? Cool, cool, cool. That'll be a lot of fucking money. After its rough first half in 2022, Netflix still believes there's room for growth with lofty goals to reach up to 800 million subscribers worldwide. What is the total addressable market of global streaming subscribers? Netflix used to say this number was somewhere between five and 800 million. Again, Netflix has 220 million subscribers today. So if that number is right, then there will be a second act here. And Netflix will again start adding customers like crazy. This is just a temporary lull. I think the going thought on Wall Street is that that number is way too aggressive. Netflix declined CNBC's request for an interview but with global hits like Stranger Things, Squid Game, and Money Heist, Netflix revolutionized how industries distribute content and how audiences consume it. But it's still unclear how Netflix will continue its story.